So here we have eight unduplicated chromosomes, and as a diploid, we have two of each kind. So when we have two of each kind of chromosome, we call these homologous chromosomes. Now it's important to remember that our chromosomes are what carry our genes. So therefore, when we look at us as diploid organisms, it's important to realize that we have two copies of each gene on autosomal chromosomes. Now this isn't true when talking about sex chromosomes because males only have one X. Um, so when we look at our chromosomes, we can think of them as like streets almost, and at certain addresses or certain locations we can find genes. So our genes, we get um, two copies. Now the copies that we get of our genes don't have to be identical. So the different versions we call alleles, and here we can see on these four different chromosomes, even though we have two of each kind, um, there's different genes and different alleles. So there's certain vocabulary that's important in understanding how we talk about our genes. So when we talk about where a gene is located on a chromosome, which would be similar to an address on a street, we call this a locus. Now locus is uh, singular, and if we're talking about more than one, we would say, for example, allele A and allele B are located at two different loci. So loci would be your plural. Now alleles R and T are inherited on two different chromosomes, where alleles A and B are linked and will be inherited together on the same chromosome, unless, of course, crossing over separates them. And then T and R are not linked because they're on separate chromosomes. So let's go ahead and look at um, a common example uh, that is used in genetics, which is eye color. So with eye color, we often talk about eye color as being a single gene trait. And a single gene trait implies that it's at one particular locus, the DNA sequence you have, that will determine your eye color. And when we think about this, though, what about the more complicated or like the, all the variations in eye color we see, like green eyes? Um, or hazel eyes, or different shades of brown, or different shades of blue. So what we see actually is that eye color is actually determined by more than one locus, more than one gene. So if a person inherits, for example, this dominant allele, this is implying that they have um, a whole lot of this protein, a melanin being made in their eye. So you can see from this case study how at the front here they have lots of melanin, where in blue-eyed people, they don't. The back of the iris in both blue and brown-eyed people have a relatively same amount of melanin. So our genes that we inherit um, in this example aren't saying the type of melanin, but rather how much melanin you make. So a blue-eyed person doesn't make blue pigment, and a brown-eyed person make brown pigment. Instead, a blue-eyed person just makes less pigment. So when the light strikes the iris, the way the light bounces around inside and bounces off of collagen fibers is actually what causes the light to reflect as blue. Um, and so when we look at our genes for this, the gene is really coding for how much melanin you make, not whether it's a blue or brown pigment. So when we look at our, um, well, we can go back here, when we look at our eye color, it really comes down to our phenotype is the type or amount of a protein that we make. So here though, if we talk about like the different variations in eye color, while blue eyes um, have little melanin of any kind, when we look at the other eye colors, um, starting you know like here in the middle region as you start to get more and more brown, um, what varies is actually the relative am amounts of different types of melanin giving a spectrum of eye shades. So really, when we talk about eye color here, so eye color, while the B allele may code for um, how much pigment or protein you make, the R and T alleles may code for different types of melanin. So therefore, when we teach eye color as like due to a single locus, that's actually false. Eye color is a trait that's inherited uh, or influenced by many different genes interacting together. So here's our 46 chromosomes, and as diploids, we can find two alleles for each gene. 
So I have two R's, two B's, two T's, and they're located on different chromosomes. So in the case of eye color, the protein products produced by each of these alleles is really how they all work together to determine our one trait of eye color. So eye color is not as simple as a single gene trait coded for at one particular locus. Instead, it's due to many traits working together. So luckily for us though, Mendel, the traits he studied in pea plants were actual single gene traits, all due to one um, locus on a particular chromosome. So we're gonna look at the white and purple flowers in our example. So here, let's see what's really happening. When we say a flower is homozygous dominant or true breeding for purple, we mean that when they inherited their two chromosomes, one in an egg and one in a sperm, that they inherited the dominant allele on both. Uh, in a heterozygote, they inherited two different versions. So the DNA sequence at this locus will be different in, on each of these chromosomes. And then in a white flower, they inherited two of the same allele, um, which we'll see how these work. So what's really happening when we talk about alleles and genes, genes code for proteins. So here, this, pro this allele is coding for a protein. And in this case, the protein is a transcription factor. And that transcription factor is going to turn on gene expression for a purple protein. So now when the flower carries this DNA sequence, carries this allele, it's going to um, turn on the production of a purple pigment, and now that flower is purple. But then how do you explain when a, a flower inherits a recessive allele? So that recessive allele is actually, when scientists studied the DNA between purple and white flowers, they found there was a one-point mutation where instead of a G, there was an A. So now you have a stop codon created in this sequence, coding for the transcription factor. So now there's no transcription factor, there's no gene expression, there's no purple pigment, and that flower develops as albino. And now it's white, because in both copies, both copies of their chromosomes at that locus, they do not have the correct DNA to code for that transcription factor. Therefore, there's no gene expressed. So when we look at flowers and their phenotype, in reality, their phenotype is dependent on the proteins that are produced or not produced. So here you can also see a heterozygote has the same phenotype as a homozygous dominant because they both make the purple pigment. You only need, as a diploid especially, one working copy to make that protein and express that phenotype. Whereas in the homozygous recessive, they don't have the correct DNA sequence to make the transcription factor for gene expression, therefore that protein is not made, and there's no purple pigment, and the flower is white. So here are some important terminology. Um, when we talk about alleles, you can talk about homozygous as true breeding, or you can call in this case homozygous dominant. Um, if we're homozygous recessive, um, we also use homozygous recessive in test crosses. So if you ever see a word problem where they say, um, a purple flower was test crossed, that means that the purple flower was crossed with a white flower, a homozygous recessive. Now, uh, the heterozygous genotype can be called heterozygous, or it can be called hybrid, and in the cases of disease, can be called a carrier. So go, let's go ahead and look at another example of alleles determining phenotype. So this is actually me and my um, uh, data from 23andMe. You can see at my chromosome number one, at this locus, I have an allele variation that makes a um, version of a protein uh, that is involved in blood clots. So if I look here at the homozygous recessive, the normal condition for this protein called thrombin is you make this blood clotting protein and it eventually becomes inactive and breaks down. So you make it uh, when you need it, but it doesn't stay. And that's the majority of people on Earth are homozygous recessive for this trait. However, on one of my chromosomes, I inherited a mutation um, where now the protein folds up different, probably due to a missense mutation, and now that blood clotting protein stays active for longer. So while I'm heterozygous, my second chromosome produces the normal functioning version of this protein, 
So this shape, it folds up correctly and it becomes inactive when necessary. So now because of this though, because one version of my gene actually makes the protein that clots blood and it stays longer in the body, I am now seven times more likely to develop blood clots in my life. Luckily for me though, if I had inherited two copies and I was homozygous dominant for this trait, I would be 80 times more likely to develop blood clots in my life because the protein would stay longer. So when we look at phenotypes we t and genotypes, we tend to think of homozygous dominant as always being good um, or the most common. And you can see in here, if you were homozygous dominant, this would actually give you low fitness. This would actually be detrimental to your health. And so um, I wanted to use this as an emphasis as well that when we say something is dominant, what we really mean is that if you produce that protein, it is expressed in your phenotype. So even as a heterozygote, I make enough of that protein where my phenotype is affected. So as a heterozygote, let's think about this. What is the likelihood of my children inheriting this blood clotting disorder from me? And before you think, well, doesn't it depend on who you mate with? Well, in reality, because this is a dominantly inherited disease, it doesn't matter who I mate with. So really the question comes down to, if I'm heterozygous, what is the likelihood that my children will inherit that dominant allele? So in G1, here are my chromosomes. In S phase, they duplicate. And then in G2, they prepare. Now let's go into M phase. The homologous chromosomes pair up. And then crossing over would happen. Homologous chromosomes separate. You have cytokinesis. Now in the second round of meiosis, then you have the sister chromatids are going to get pulled to opposite sides of the cell. Then cytokinesis happens again, and I end up with four gametes. So in this example, you can see that every time I go through meiosis and make eggs, or an egg, there's a 50% chance that my egg will carry that dominant allele. There's a 50% chance that my egg will carry that recessive allele. So therefore, the likelihood that my children will inherit that dominant blood clotting disorder is going to be 50% chance every time I have a child. And the fact that my alleles as a heterozygote separate into gametes is actually Mendel's law of segregation, which states that during gamete formation, the alleles for each gene segregate or separate from each other so that each gamete carries only one allele for each gene. So therefore, the chance of my child inheriting this is 50%. So if we look at Punnett squares, and Punnett squares is a tool uh, used to like make predictions or look at the probability of traits being inherited in offspring. If we make four gametes, how come we don't set up our Punnett squares like this? Why do it on the side over here on the left? Because if we were to write it out with um, four, that would be redundant, right? We don't need to write the big B twice when it's just copying it a second time. So when we look at Punnett squares, our Punnett squares are representing Mendel's law of segregation that our alleles separate. Okay, so let's look at another example of um, <coughs> traits being inherited. So there's an inherited disease called cystic fibrosis that is inherited as autosomal recessive. So now in this um, uh, inherited disease, the allele for cystic fibrosis that DNA sequence actually quote, like has a missense mutation where that protein channel folds up incorrectly and their chloride ions don't travel. So when we look at a person who is homozygous dominant, they do not carry cystic fibrosis um, mutation. However, a hybrid or a heterozygote, we can actually call a carrier because they carry that mutation with them. Now, if you look at this, though, the person who's heterozygous is totally healthy and fine because at least one copy of their chromosomes know how to make that, um, that protein channel. Now, only a person who's homozygous recessive will be affected with cystic fibrosis um, because they don't have any information on how to make correct protein channels. So here we can write and see how a homozygous recessive would be affected. Now, what would be the phenotype of a person who inherits two copies of the mutant allele? Well, their phenotype would be the half cystic fibrosis. What would be the genotype of a person who is hybrid for this gene? Uh, and what would be the cross between these two individuals? 
So this right here would be your person with cystic fibrosis, and this would be your hybrid.